We are here to talk about feature stores and recommender systems. Uh, so a little background about me. So I currently work at Tecton with a focus on Feast, which is the open source feature store that we offer. Uh, and, I, and I manage that team. But prior to that, I was at Google um, leading some machine learning systems uh, within Google Workspace. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to talk to you today about and nerd out about all the feature store space. And a quick uh, high-level agenda of what I want to cover today. So I want to first align this on roughly like you know what is a recommender system, what is a feature store. Uh, both of those, I think, are actually fairly ambiguous terms. Um, and then I'm going to go over some challenges that I typically see people going through when they're building recommender systems. Uh, and then specifically hone into a couple of them. So like, how do you build low latency um, systems like this? Uh, how do you ensure correctness? And then finally, if I have time, I'm going to try to sneak in uh, how you might integrate Feast into your workflows to, to get value out of a, um, such a system. So yeah, what is a recommender system? Um, I think that there's a lot of terms out, a lot of different definitions out there. I'm going to give you my personal take on this. And my personal take is really, this is any kind of system where you're trying to match one kind of entity to another kind of entity. So uh, the canonical examples of this would be e-commerce, would you, where you're matching users to items that they want to purchase, or media streaming, where you're matching users to videos. Uh, but I think it goes a lot broader than that. So uh, you know, I was reading like a very interesting paper by AstraZeneca, where they are trying to do drug discovery, which is basically you're trying to match drugs to uh, diseases that are going to solve uh, a cure, right? And so those are, uh, there's a lot of different use cases that all match this kind of paradigm uh, that all suffer from the same kind of like challenges, right? Um, and then I think there's also two big kind of ways you build recommender systems. One of them is what I call batch predictions, which is where you pre-compute all of your recommendations that you want to serve to the users, and then you cache them and you want to like serve them online, right? Um, maybe you're doing this every single day, so this might be like a, um, for like the Amazon homepage, you pre-compute every single user's like first default landing page, and then you serve them um, when the user hits the website, right? And that's to be contrasted with online predictions, which kind of uh, are where really in that same example, when the user clicks on the website, you're live computing uh, the recommendations on the spot based off of the information they have available at that time, right? So, um, and what I've been seeing in the community is that most people start with the batch predictions use case. This is like way easier to build. And uh, kind of generally, you know, if you can get away with it, that's where I would just stop almost. Uh, but I am seeing a very large trend towards like where the most business critical problems you move into that online world, right? And as you can imagine, with an online recommender system, you introduce a long tail of operational challenges. Um, yeah, here I call out that there's, uh, in practice, a lot of times you have this candidate generation step and a re-ranking step. So candidate generation is where uh, you, for example, filter down items. You have like millions of items. What was that? Oh, sorry. Did not realize. Um, yeah, so uh, where you typically have you know millions of items and you're filtering them down to maybe like a set of 100 or 1,000, and then you have a re-ranking model that figures out which of those 100 or 1,000 are the most important for, for the users to see, right? So. Apologies for that. Um, yeah, so, and then what is a feature store? And a feature store, I think, is similarly ambiguous uh, to recommender system, perhaps even more so. Uh, so my take on a feature store is really, um, it's a piece of infrastructure that owns the entire life cycle uh, of a feature, kind of from how do you translate from a raw data into features all the way down to like how do you end up using them? And there's kind of two different ways you might use them, right? You might be training data training based on that data for you know, your data scientists are interacting with this, or you might be having a, an online production system that needs to access features you know, very, very quickly. Right? So feature stores should uh, own the entire life cycle of, those, of that data. Um, and kind of with that definition in mind, there's a bunch of downstream benefits, uh, which I'm not going to go through because we are short on time. So yeah, let me walk you through a typical journey of how a company, uh, uh, you know, days of old kind of company would actually go about doing this. I think this is actually kind of different nowadays where, um, you know, sometimes you're a company that's like, I need to sneak an ML into my pitch deck to get funding. Uh, so maybe you start early, a little bit earlier on, but, you know, take like the example of uh, 
the e-commerce website, typically people are building a, a core business first, and then they kind of move more and more gradually into recommender systems. So you might be building a website that uh, allows users to buy items, to sell items, and then have a purchase history that they can see, right? And then kind of the company, some C-level executive will say, well, how do I kind of generate more business? How do I get um, you know, users to buy more items? And that's where you might throw in a heuristic, right? So maybe you'll show like the most popular items uh, in a particular category as just a quick initial heuristic. And then kind of the company then realizes, well, that doesn't really do too much. That does you know, a little bit, right? But you actually want to be suggesting based off of you know, a, a much more dynamic set of data. You want to uh, train based off your data. And that's where you start moving into this uh, batch recommendations, uh, that batch predictions kind of mode that I talked about, right? And, and that's kind of where most users will stop, uh, which I think is perfectly fine. Gets most of the job done. Uh, but increasingly, there's a lot more users who kind of move past that and go into this online recommender world, right? And then that last step there is where you actually need to, you know, often you actually add even more layers on top of this. So uh, as an example with YouTube, um, you have to think about how do you encourage more diversity of videos? How do you encourage ML fairness? And those introduce additional uh, pre and post processing steps. Um, so there's a lot of challenges. Oh, whoop. I keep doing this guy. There's a lot of challenges with uh, uh, recommender systems and I'm not gonna go through all of them. I just wanted to kind of call out some broad categories here. Um, so there's some operational challenges here as we've discussed, there's unique challenges with respect to feature engineering uh, in recommender systems. And uh, you know, since you're moving data around a lot, there's a lot of opportunity for data quality to um, just go bad. And then uh, there's organizational components to this, like you're working with different kinds of uh, users, data scientists, data engineers, um, kind of infra engineers within an organization. And kind of, you know, I couldn't really figure out the right category, but this last miscellaneous uh, bucket also is really, really important, and privacy and, um, I think I said cold start. Yes, uh, cold start, they're all very, very important. Um, a couple ones I wanted to call out here. Um, one of them is, that's kind of ambiguous is access to request data. So um, the way that this kind of manifests is often some of the most useful features you want to get access to are uh, need to be computed on fly. So for example, I think time is a really good example of this. So like if you are trying to predict what a user's buying patterns will be, you will need to understand like what time of the day is it, what day of the week might it be, even like what kind of season during the year for you to accurately kind of predict what they need. And that all cannot be really encapsulated accurately in a batch predictions uh, model, right? Um, yeah, so what I do want to quickly dive more deeply into is some of the operational challenges uh, going into this. And uh, kind of the quick two highlights here is that um, one of one of the big challenges is how do you have really fresh features? So like uh, features that are kind of computed and accurate, uh, you know, as as accurate as possible to this point in time, um, and that often results in a pretty write heavy system. Uh, and we're going to kind of dive into why uh, that's challenging and why that's important. But you can imagine that you know, like I just talked about how request data can be important. There's a lot of other information that's really important, uh, such as like your user your user session data. Um, your preferences over the course of a session are going to be shifting pretty rapidly, so you also need to take that into account, right? And then the second bucket is uh, more focused on how do you actually fetch feature data for a, for a bunch of entities at the same time, and this is this kind of goes into that like re-ranking step where you need to figure out of these like hundreds or thousands of items, how do you you know which ones are most important? So you really want to get a lot of features in a short period amount of time. Um, yeah, so when I think about achieving lower latency, this is obviously a, a very big simplification. There's a lot of challenges that come into here. Uh, three I wanted to call out. So one of them is balancing all the requirements that you have. So like read versus write and like optimizing for cost. Um, there's another kind of aspect which is around type convergence, which I think is really interesting and a pretty hard to solve problem. And then finally, there's also just like the whole branch of optimizations that go into uh, making a batch retrieval um, API performance. And so the first one I wanted to dive into is uh, how do you actually build 
uh, how do you balance these requirements, right? So there's a lot of things um, in this list. Two of them are kind of balancing that the you have two different challenges. One of them is that you want to have very fresh features. You want to have very frequent like streams that are updating um, the features that you have access to at serving time, but you also want to get access to those features very, very quickly, right? And I highlight two example strategies on the right but I think it's more instructive to look at a potential example here. So here on the left side, you see, uh, so maybe like you're building a model and you just want all the features for a given user um, to immediately uh, kind of pass to your model. So in practice, right, you might think that uh, you just want to have all that stored in the same table uh, as part of what you're, you know, what I'm turning the online store, which is the database that uh, you're using to store these features uh, that you serve to the, to the end model, right? Um, and that you know can work in practice, right? But in practice, you know, there's various columns in here that are being updated by different uh, sources. So you have some, for example, in this use case, uh, user metadata that's not really going to be changing that often. You have some other things that will change a lot more frequently. Maybe like you have like a user location, uh, user like you know last item that they kind of viewed, and that's going to be coming from very different event sources, and that's all going to be modifying this kind of view. Of the table, and you need to keep track of timestamps in all this because you want to ensure that you can monitor like freshness of features, and um, kind of within this left side view, you don't really know uh, kind of what timestamps match to which one. So you really need to have timestamps for each field, right? And contrast that to the right hand side, um, which is basically the approach that Feast takes, right? Which is you uh, split it split it up by the actual source, and now you can have event timestamps that match to a variety of things. Like any, any feature that may be updated at the same time that has one timestamp. Um, and this, this lets you also avoid some sort of like read uh, or write contention as well, right? Like traditional databases, you only really have uh, row level blocking or transactions. And so um, this makes it a lot easier because now you, you know, the tables that are more likely to be updated quickly that you can all, uh, that's separated from say the user metadata or you can have two different streams that are both simultaneously updating their own respective tables, right? And you won't run into any issues there. Um, but to me, like the most important benefit of this is it's a little is a lot simpler to manage, right? And this will also match the data schema that you're going to have in your um, in your data lake, for example. Uh, so it just makes a lot more sense in my mind. And uh, in practice, what I've seen is that the latency hit is not that bad if you split it up into tables. Uh, but there's a lot of cases where you know the left hand side could make a lot of sense too, right? Um, yeah. So the second example here is around how do you encourage feature reuse across models and how do you manage costs, right? So, um, in in a lot of cases, you the the goal you know a lot of people come to feature stores and say, well, I want to encourage reuse of features across different models across different teams. Uh, but this introduces unique challenges, right? Like, what happens if you have a model in production that relies, you know, you have, say you have two models that rely on the same features. What if, you know, some upstream user that's working on one of these models says, I want to update like an embedding, right? Um, and they just go ahead and kind of update that. That will then cause the second model to just like start having unexpected behaviors, right? And so, uh, how do you need to get around that? You need to think about feature versioning, right? So, the example I have here. Um, I guess actually it doesn't uh, crisply uh, articulate that in particular, but um, um, I guess yeah, the embedding example probably is more instructive. The this example I think is more useful for thinking about cost management. So uh, one kind of sample example uh, of how you might use <coughs> this is you're trying to predict like user buying patterns, and you want to include features of like the last five items that the users buy. Right, so you kind of have a transaction ID that has a bunch of features corresponding to that, and you're storing all these features somewhere within uh, within the feature store, right? And as you can imagine, well, um, you not all these transactions really matter. You want to actually expire them over time, right? Because you know, presumably a transaction that happened a year ago is not not going to be super important. Um, there's a little warning there, right? Which is that what happens if you have uh, different models that all rely on this data? So you could have for example, one model that only needs the last five transactions and another model that needs the last like 28 days of transactions, right? And so you need to kind of be a little bit careful about how you manage this. Another um, challenge that, we're, that we run into 
uh, is with managing types. So there's kind of a correctness angle to this as well as a performance angle. So the performance angle is on the fly, you're kind of, you have to do some sort of like marshalling of, of types. So the user, when they expect a response, they have you know one set of type systems that they want to um, collect. But the infrastructure person building that is working with different type systems. So like maybe you're working with like some models are using Redis as an online source, some models are using Dynamo. They all have distinct type systems. And so you want to actually introduce an abstraction, a separate type layer so that the users don't necessarily need to know what the underlying implementation details are, right? So that results in you having to, uh, on the platform side, having type conversions, and that can be very expensive, especially as you scale in the amount of data that you uh, output. Got it, we'll move more quickly. Um, the TLDR of this is that, uh, you know, in practice, what you really need is like a, a standard type system that works across the board, and we've started leaning more and more into Apache Arrow as a solution uh, for this. Um, and then batch retrieval, so wanted to kind of quickly dive into some of the example strategies here, uh, since I think we've already talked about what the, the what the problem here is. So um, in this example, right, like it really matters what the boundary that you draw for this the system is, this feature store system is. So if you want to retrieve a bunch, of, in this example, it's a uh, say you want to fetch a feature, bunch of features for a bunch of stores, like you want to match a, a user to the most likely store they want to buy from, right? Um, if you just tell if you just say like give me all the features for a bunch of different entities, well then the system doesn't really know how those entities are distributed. And so you may actually start hitting multiple partitions or in the Redis clusters you might have to send separate um, network requests to different nodes in order to get the actual features you need. Um, but if you can actually encode some of that, right, like and more likely you actually want uh, near nearby stores to all be collected at the same time. Those are that's more likely, right? So there's a lot of benefits to having the system understand more end-to-end -end what's happening here and being able to optimize that on the storage level. I'm going to just jump through a little bit more. Um, yeah, this is, I think, just a, a pretty standard uh, pattern where it is uh, beneficial to have different caching layers. So probably the, the biggest point here, I think, is that different stores have different benefits and do support different use cases. One example here is that um, more traditional databases like Dynamo uh, they're very good for like range range scans, right? Whereas Redis is very, it's just at the end of the day, uh, a really, really performance key value store, right? Uh, that um, kind of works, I mean, technically they're both key value stores, but Redis is not as optimized for the range scans. So you often wanna have multiple caching layers to, um, to, to and Redis in, in practice is a lot faster for use cases it supports, right? So you can cache all those hot uh, items that, and entities that you want in Redis and then kind of defer, fall back to Dynamo uh, if possible. Right. Um, let's see, I have eight minutes left, is that right? Cool, uh, so I'm just gonna zoom past this. So as you can imagine, there's a bunch of different ways that bad data can fall into this, there's, um, including um, like you have faulty transformation logic, you have um, streams that are just giving you bad data, they, or maybe they're failing and they, st they stop publishing, so you have stale data, right? And so within this, you know, given that feature source managing the entire um, life cycle of this data as it becomes a feature, uh, more pretty naturally you would imagine that you need to have some observabil observability layer here. And so um, to not only help you figure out where data is going bad, but also maybe like concept drift, um, you know, when you sh should be retraining your data, tra retraining your models, and uh, let's see, and also kind of how do you, how to deal with bad data on the fly if your streams are giving you bad data. So some sort of fallback mechanism uh, is usually very useful. Uh, one thing that I wanted to call out, so Feast today does have an integrations with great expectations, which is a, an amazing tool. Um, however, kind of, this is kind of a standard, like I'd say expectation versus reality kind of situation, which is, uh, you expect data to be all like pretty easy to figure out that like drift and anomalies are kind of easy to figure out. Um, in practice, you have to you have data scientists who are looking at each metric or each feature that you're working with and setting thresholds to make this kind of system possible, right? And that that's a very what we've seen is that that's a very uh, intensive process. And so uh, the first cut of feast is just a simple integration, but an area that I see as being uh, relatively un. un uh, untapped right here is like how do you 
um, abstract a lot of that kind of manual twiddling that you need to do to make this system not be super um, kind of false positive heavy, right? Uh, I'm just going to skip over that. That was an architecture of how Feast handles it. Um, this, uh, yeah, I'm just going to skip over this too, but the, this, the, the theme here is basically that um, you, might, you might think that tr a simple transformation library might just help. So like at training time, you call this one transformation library. At serving time, you call this transformation library. No problem with, with transformations. In practice, kind of there, it's a lot more complicated than that especially when you think about like how to get access to the request data um, that, that you need for all those features that are really, really powerful, right? And there's also some, uh, you know, obviously like differences between how do you optimize for fast model serving versus training if you want to achieve consistency, right? Like you can't just simply call pandas in both situations because pandas has a large overhead when you're working with smaller data sets in serving. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip over this too. Um, yeah, so, so Feast, uh, just kind of a quick, quick plug here. So Feast is an open source feature store that is actively thinking about a lot of these issues. Um, and we have a pr very active community with over 3,000 members. And we support a variety of different stores. So like uh, GCP, AWS, Azure. Um, we have very close partners on, on the Snowflake side as well and Redis. And we do have a large number of on-prem users, um, and kind of, uh, you know, I've already talked about how like what the goals of a feature store are. But suffice to say, like a lot of challenges we discussed today are like very top of mind for me, and how we, um, you know, how we design this with the goal of simplifying uh, the end user's experience. So, like the the goal is to not, for example, throw a lot of infrastructure at you that you then need to manage because that's only kind of replacing one problem with a different problem, right? And um, yeah, I wanted to kind of like show that uh, this kind of quick web UI on the right side, which is something that we've been working on recently. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of users, when they come to us, you know, they, they talked about how they want to reuse features. Um, and so a very critical component, I think more critical than the average use case when you think about uh, collaboration is a web UI that tells you, helps you manage lineage, helps you manage, um, helps you give us an area where you can see like, here's all the data that's moving around and all the different observability layers. Uh, so I would imagine that this web UI in the future would also have pretty tight integration with that data quality monitoring aspect. Um, but let's see. Uh, and then uh, I think a really key component here is that there is a plug, everything's very pluggable um, because every single system has its own unique use cases and Feast stance on it is everything should basically be an interface. So you can kind of use most of what's already there and then say abstract away the online store and maybe like compose different online stores if you want to do caching or um, add your own like say authentication, authentication layers into, uh, into Feast. Um, yeah, I think this is actually kind of interesting. So, uh, but actually and talk to me more in, in office hours if you want to learn more about how people deploy Feast. Um, so yeah, I think in the batch recommender system use case, really some of the key value adds here are in that collaboration and in that like discovery of features uh, and understanding that lineage. Uh, but really, this applies to any situation where you have models right, that need access to features in different kinds of environments. Um, and then in online recommender systems, it gets a lot more complicated. right? You have uh, a lot of different models. You have like a user tower often that you're working with. You have a re-ranking model. And you're kind of accessing them at, you know, in one way at training time and in a different, very, very different way uh, at serving time, right? especially since you're trying to generate embeddings often on the fly. And so with all that, um, Feast can be a very powerful tool for uh, essentially getting those, like not needing to worry about how do you move features around. Um, you can just collect them, you know, call the simple API and I'll give you the, the right kind of features at the right time, right? Um, and then kind of very quickly, I wanted to walk through uh, kind of an example of what a, you know, we've talked about like request data quite a bit. Um, in this presentation, so like, what does that actually look like in Feast, right? So, uh, on the very top, on the right hand side, you can see a, a declaration of here's all the data you have access to at request time. That's kind of a feature view that gets registered, uh, so that people can, can data scientists can understand what additional signals they have access to. And then on the bottom, you can then see that you know we're doing some simple like feature crossing that takes some of this data that you have 
uh, at request time and crosses it with uh, some previous features on the uh, that you are kind of loading into memory from uh, historical data that you kind of basically you pre compute some some embeddings or features and you load that up into memory. Uh, but there's a lot of different kinds of features that uh, you know I'm actively interested in supporting. So talk to me afterwards if you're interested in nerding about nerding out about that a little bit more. Um, yeah. So kind of some key takeaways is really that you know the the biggest not real takeaway is that recommender systems are really complicated, right? Especially as you move online, which is definitely the trend. And uh, feature stores, I, I think, can help you enforce best practices in all the different moving parts of the system, especially with a focus on the data angle as it relates to features. And uh, kind of consistent and performant on-demand transformations are what we see as being very, very key to kind of solving a lot of these challenges in, in these systems. I think that's it. So I think I'm on time. Perfect. So thank you, everyone. Uh, talk to me afterwards.